Hi, I'm Amanda Lisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. And in episode 15 of Essential Cooking, we talk with journalist Zahir Jan Mohammed about how Dearborn's food scene is coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. Zahir is a Zell Writing Fellow at the University of Michigan and is the co-founder of the James Beard-nominated podcast, Racist Sandwich. He told James and I about the difficulty Dearborn restaurant owners face when applying for COVID relief loans, enforcing social distancing, and how the business models for Dearborn restaurants sets them apart from the rest of Metro Detroit. We wanted to talk about the food community in Dearborn and how um, uniquely that community has been affected by the pandemic. And that was a lot of what your article was about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I was an artist in residence at the Arab American National Museum in the month of November. Um, And East Dearborn is a community that is uh, majority Arab, Uh, not officially, but, you know, kind of unofficially, like it it is mostly Arab. Right. And has um, and I was interested in looking at how the pandemic has affected um, the the restaurant uh, industry there. Because um, during my graduate studies at University of Michigan, I spent all my time in Dearborn, I feel like it, or uh, eating at restaurants. And I was worried that some of my favorite restaurants would be impacted. And so I spent the month interviewing different restaurants and chefs and waiters and staff, et cetera. And what did you find? Like, what surprised you? I mean, you know, we knew that the pandemic had hit the restaurant industry um, all across the country incredibly hard. But what impacted you about that community in particular and how they were, um, those restaurateurs were affected? Sure, yeah. So um, first I found that most businesses said they were down about 70%. Um, So particularly um, because a lot of the restaurants, you know, multi-generational families. um, And so transitioning to online is really difficult, especially if you have like a big Lebanese platter or a big Mm -hmm. sort of Yemeni platter. It's hard to sort of, transition that food to online. Some of the burger places have actually done really well, like Tasty's, which is in a gas station. Right. But others, business was down 70%. That's number one. Number two is <clears throat> they um, had a hard time enforcing sh- social distancing sometimes. Uh, mostly the places were good. But, you know, oftentimes someone comes in and they may be family friends from back in Lebanon or back in Iraq. And how do you call someone out who, you know, you've grown up, grown up with? Um, so we saw a spike in, in COVID numbers, you know, all throughout Metro Detroit and, and in Dearborn as well, too. And reining that in can be challenging. I mean, I was there and there was a big wedding. I didn't attend the wedding, um, but there was a wedding, I think, the third weekend of November. And so it's challenging because you have some people taking it very, very seriously, and the vast majority, but others aren't. And we're seeing that across the United States. It's not just people on the right who are Trump supporters. We're seeing that across the board. And the last thing I wanted to highlight was that um, many people wanted support from the, from the government, but didn't know how to ask for it or where to go or how to fill out the forms, et cetera. And so they sort of just rely on community you know, resources. If, let's say, the restaurant is owned by one brother and the other brother is a pharmacist, and you kind of like have the pharmacist bail out the restaurant owner brother, you know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. James, you and I talked about that a little bit, how to navigate Um, the administrative part of getting PPP money, I mean, that seems to be um, across the board a little bit of a challenge. It is. A lot of it has to do with relationships you might have already with banks. So a lot of these family businesses don't have big relationships with banks. So you're kind of put to the back of the line, especially if there's any language barriers or just, you know, I mean, even even for me, obviously I'm from here, you know, I I, speak English fluently and like I still am reading some of these um, restrictions and challenges and timings and it's it's hard to figure out. So I definitely... um, you know, can't imagine if I had a language barrier or if, you know, if it was first generation and it's, it's, uh, it's tough for all restaurants, but I, I definitely think that, yeah, it's, it's a super interesting article and, and perspective to talk about, you know, what, what Dearborn has in the food scene is so valuable to us, you know, as, as, as Michiganders, just because it's such a unique uh, point of view, the, the cultural influences. I learn a lot about culture through food. So these restaurants need to be, you know, protected and, and, and supported. And I think that, you know, for, whether it's local government or national government, there definitely needs to be more support to restaurants in general, let alone those that need, uh, you know, special assistance and are, are fabrics of the community. Just to add, I mean, to, to James' point, I mean, I think what's interesting also about the Dearborn food scene is like, so most restaurants there um, don't serve alcohol. Um, a lot, lot of Muslims live in East Dearborn. And so the business model is oftentimes different in that they, they tend to, to, to stay afloat by volume. And so yeah. let's say El Amir, for example, mm-hmm. or um, Sheba, the Yemeni place, you know, you, 
what, before the pandemic, I remember one time I went out, took a party of 25 <laughs> and I showed up and I was like, I'm with the party of 25 and the, the Metro D said, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. it's like, it's like, and that was really common. That's a really, lo- and the restaurants are built for huge groups to gather. The, the, the food is very affordable, 10 to $12 a person generally. And so they, that's how they make money. Whereas now, I mean, like you, you look at a lot of the restaurants, maybe they'll get like a, a tiny fraction of that. And then when the pandemic is over, whenever we have the vaccine uh, rolled out, I don't know if that, that kind of dining is going to come back for a while. And so a lot of them are wondering, like, even when the vaccine comes out, you know, how are they going to be able to stay afloat? Um, because, you know, they're, they're not as high margins on food as there is on alcohol. So um, a lot of questions about what kind of what the food scene will look like when this is all over. You know, from from your time talking to um, all the different restaurants, what do you think that what was the shared narrative of how the public can help? So if people are listening right now and they're like, you know, wow, like do they are they just encouraging just traditional carry out, like call the restaurant and order food? Are they looking for more outside of the box? Like, what do you think is the takeaway that the public can, uh, you know, respond to with with, you know, all the conversations you had? Sure. I would say like two things. I'm sure you've heard this in your experience. Number one is be willing to pay a little bit extra for food. Um, prices are so low. I mean, you get like a killer shawarma in Dearborn for, you know, $5 or right. something, you know? It's too cheap, so it's it's too cheap today, already. <laughs> exactly. It is too cheap already. And, you know, no one likes to admit that, but like if, if the shawarma goes up to $6, hey, I'll pay, I'll pay $7, whatever, Agreed. for a really good shawarma. Agreed. Right. So that's number one. Number two is be more empathetic with some of the staff there. So some of the places they'll close earlier because they need extra time to do all the cleaning, et cetera, to be a little bit more understanding um, of, of what they're going through right now. And the third is really like, if you have the means to like, you know, cater. Um, and that's how a lot of these places have, have been able to like stay afloat is people have, you know, people live in extended families in Dearborn. So you'll cater a meal uh, and that can really help them a lot. Um, so, so those are three things that I heard. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. So here, one of the things that you mentioned in your article was that, um, you know, through the restaurant industry and in the past few years, um, a lot of residents are heading back to their home country. They're heading out of Detroit and out of Dearborn. I wanted you to talk a little bit about what's happening with that. Is it still happening? And just to shed some light on that, I had no idea, you know, that we were losing citizens in this community and that they're heading back home and they're not coming back. Like they're heading back to their, their home country? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like, you know, part of it is um, that that has been happening. I think that these last four years with the Trump administration and the travel ban and the various, you know, humanitarian crises happening in the Middle East, I think a lot of people have um, decided to move back. Um, I think I see that among an, an older generation. Mm-hmm. Um it was really moving for me to be there in November for lots of reasons. One of them is to, to witness, um, frankly, Trump lose and to see people celebrating and the, the sense of like, hey, Trump lost. I can go visit my relatives again back in Yemen. Um, so there's there, there's that. But also, I think, um, you know, how fragile a lot of these businesses are. So, you know, I, I there's a lot that didn't make it into the article, but I interviewed several successful restaurant owners in Dearborn and they were telling me like they're barely making making enough money to get by. And I would think like, wow, like before the pandemic, I don't know what your experience, you know, James or Anne was like, but I could rarely get restaurant owners to talk about how much money they make. Oh yeah. But it's during the, the yeah. pandemic, I feel like people tell me all the time how much they make. Yeah. Because I think they want the public to know, like, look, that 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 burger place that you love, that kebab place you love, guess what? The 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 chef is only making, you know, forty thousand dollars or something. And yeah. that's kind of hard to get by. And and before I couldn't get those numbers. And so I think a lot of people have evaluated. That said, I think among a younger generation, I think things are shifting. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the food scene. A lot of younger generation are saying, look, burgers, tacos, pizza, things like that. They travel well. It's easy to Instagram that kind of food. So um, I'm optimistic about this younger generation. 
You know, you, you, you make a good point because I think in this industry, a lot of the times that, you know, success through volume, especially if a restaurant owner is doing well, they want to be quiet about it because they don't want to hear scrutiny about prices or if, you know, if somebody's doing, oh, like we had a record year, oh, well, then maybe you should charge less for your food. And I think a lot of times, totally. you know, certain foods like shawarma get viewed as low value because there's so many of them and because it's large and plentiful, which is unfair. You know, they, they, you imagine a piece of fish is more valuable than a taco, but, you know, and that, yeah. those, those kind of relationships we have with food. Are, are wrong and broken. So yeah, I, th- I definitely think that money has never been talked about more in the restaurant industry, um, but it's a very important subject and hopefully, it, you know, we can kind of start to heal wounds and repair things, you know, as we move forward and get out of this pandemic. But there's so much work to do in the restaurant industry at large Absolutely. that it was already such a broken industry. This just kind of like sh- exposed all the, all the cracks and breaks and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's heavy lifting to do to, to, to make it right again. Absolutely. Um, Zahir, I wanted to um, make mention of the fact that you have your own podcast called The Racist Sandwich. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, on your website, when you go on there, it says food and the ways we consume, create, and interpret food can be political. I wanted you to be able to talk about your podcast a little bit um, so because it's a fascinating podcast, but I just wanted you to shed some light on it and talk about sure. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the podcast is called Racist Sandwich. Uh, it started in... Gosh, it feels like ages ago, 2016. <laughs> and Soleil and I started. Soleil is now the head restaurant critic at the San Francisco Chronicle. So um, we had both, like, we met in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, and um, we really wanted to sort of figure out um, Portland is the whitest city in America, above 500,000. And we saw um, a lot of restaurants popping up, like having Indian food or, you know, um, let's say like even Somali food but very little conversation about the communities behind those, th- those foods. And so we saw, just like James said earlier, I think food is such a great way into these difficult conversations. Or, 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 or food is also a great way to learn about different communities. Um, and so uh, the name Racist Sandwich actually came from a principal at a school who said that if a school is predominantly Latino or Latinx, maybe you don't serve peanut butter and jelly sandwich, maybe you serve a torta. And the conservative commentators, they flipped out and they said she's calling the sandwich racist, which she wasn't. She was just saying, tailor a school based on the demographics of the of, of that school. Mm-hmm. So we we did like, um, so we actually, uh, Soleil and I both stepped away from the podcast in 2018. For, uh, I was doing graduate school, Soleil is at the Chronicle. But um, we explored subjects such as anti-Semitism. We explored uh, what's it like to, even like the uh, restaurants are oftentimes designed for people who are thin, thin-bodied. So if you're, you know, if you're fat and having trouble, you know, let's say sitting in some of the chairs at restaurants, we explored um, a wide variety of subjects. We, but mainly the idea was to center conversations around food, around people of community. Um, so like what James mentioned earlier, this idea that a shawarma, we expect a shawarma to be $6. So my parents are Indian American. When we go out for Indian food, my parents will definitely roll their eyes if the bill comes to like 50 bucks for a family of five, <laughs> maybe 60 bucks. Okay. But like, if we go out for Italian food, like it's, it's $150, <laughs> you know, I mean, and we're Indian, this is our, our cuisine. Um, so, so that was really the idea is to how to have these conversations. I think these conversations can be difficult. And so when we started in 2016, there wasn't a lot of conversation around, um, around race and food. Now, you know, it's, it's actually a lot of people have been having these conversations. There's good documentaries on Netflix. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy with the, the conversation, not just on food and race, but also food and class as well, too, and food and gender. You know, like I, when I met Soleil, she was running a restaurant in Portland, Oregon, and customers would come up and say to her, like, oh, this is great food. Please compliment the chef. And Soleil, I think she was 28 at the time, mm-hmm. she'd say, I am the chef. And they just this assumption that we think like, you know, or, or, or women chefs would come up to me and say, oh, I love your podcast. I want to be on it. And I'm like, well, just come on it. And they're like, but I'm not a chef. I'm like, you'd run a restaurant. <laughs> so like the ways in which like this, this gendered aspect, again, some of that's changing, but um, that was kind of the purpose of the show. And then uh, it still goes on, but we have new hosts because right. I've just been uh, doing other things. Well, congratulations. There's some great content Thank living you. there. Um, and one final thing, Zahir, you know, you and I were trading emails last night, and uh, you mentioned that you worked in Congress for a while. I did, yeah. When yeah. were you there? And I'm sure um, you had been in that building um, that has been on the news constantly on a 24-hour-a-day cycle, um, a space that none of us, I mean, you know, almost almost none of us ever 
uh, walk into, you were in that building. You were in the Capitol building uh, working. Talk about what it felt yeah. like when you were working there and then um, when you saw uh, the event of last week. Yeah, sure. So I worked from 2009 to 2011, actually from a Detroit-born congressman, Congressman Keith Ellison from Minnesota, mm-hmm. uh, who's African-American. And um, I had an incredible experience. Um, you know, I'm I'm the son of immigrants from Tanzania. My parents are Indians from Tanzania. And, you know, this. I think there's something remarkable about, you know, um, me being able to go up and work in Congress one day. And I was on the House floor and I was on the Senate floor. Um, and I had a lot of respect for the institution of Congress, even though I realized that a lot of members of Congress are kind of wacko. Um, but watching the footage last week and then some of the footage that's come out since, it's been utterly heartbreaking. Um, not just for the individuals who were, were killed, but also just this denigration of this institution and this denigration of 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 this democratic, uh, the, the, of, of our democracy. Um, you know, when I worked in Congress, I had a lot of friends who are Republican and we could sit, sit and have disagreements. And when they threw me a going away party, when I left Congress, you know, we were all hanging out and it was fun. And now we've become so incredibly polarized that we're literally attacking each other. And now the, the National Mall is closed, not because of some outside threat, but because we're afraid of each other and w- with good reason. So I guess for me, I'm feeling sadness right now and also confusion about how we go from there. Um, You know, I hope um, I hope one day, you know, my kid, you know, decides to work in Congress. But I also hope it's a very different Congress. Then I hope it's also a very different America because I had a great time. Um, I learned a lot about democracy. I learned a lot about respecting people of different opinions. And I really wonder, like, that wasn't that long ago. That was about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's really been on my mind right now. Um, it's been tough to watch the news. Our thanks to Zahir Jan Mohammed for talking with us and to you for listening. And we would like to thank LaMarca Prosecco for their support. From the hills of Veneto, Italy, you can never go wrong with Prosecco, whether it's in a spritz or drinking straight. Joan Isabella is our executive producer. Assistant producers are David Lyons and Lisa Brancato. This episode was edited by Rowan Nemisto with production support provided by Studios on the Pond. Original music by the Mallet Brothers. This is a production of Detroit's public radio station, WDET.